Streaming is on. Is on. All right, we're good. All right, um, welcome everybody to the April meeting of the Western North Carolina Linux Users Group. Um, don't believe we have any scheduled um, presentation for today, but uh, I think we'll just go around the room and see what people are up to. Um, just um, in the sake for the sake of uh, not losing them, let's talk to Dan first. <laughs> okay, let me turn my phone off because it just interrupted and I couldn't hear a thing you said. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. okay. All right. Well, this month I, uh, I've been dealing with a lot of health issues, but I um, was able to do um, one thing, I think, uh, this month. In last month, in the month of um, March, I did a presentation on... Uh, open media vault and setting up a raid one array with the two spinning three terabyte drives that I have in a dual bay enclosure, a Sabrin enclosure. And that was working. Okay. I was concerned that open media vault warns that um, you don't want to set up a raid array in open media vault. If you're using a USB connected system, because it will fall over most likely. Well, I guess what? <laughs> I um, moved my system, Open Media Vault, from the 3B Plus Raspberry Pi to the Model 4 because it has more RAM. It has four gigs of RAM instead of one, and you know it just makes sense to do that. Um, and that worked fine. I mean, I set up Open Media Vault and and um, and everything. And uh, when I moved over the system to that particular Raspberry Pi, it, it fell over. So what I decided to do was to say, okay, forget it. I'm not going to do that because I had to go around the uh, application to set it up in the first place. Once you go around it, then it recognizes your RAID and you can go work with it in the application. Well, that's kind of clunky. I didn't want to do that. And um, so what I've done instead is I have set up Gene, what you what are you doing? Uh, you keep saying fell over. What does that mean? It means it fell apart. Died, oh, okay. Fell over. It's a, te it's a techie term. All right. Well, I, yeah, I'm not a techie. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bits all over the floor. Uh, yeah. S I T B is another one, uh, and then you know, shat the bed. No. But then, <laughs> okay. Me. Good enough. Okay. Say no more. So anyway, um, so what I did was. Instead of setting up the rate again, I, I still want to be able to access the, you know, the uh, uh, NAS that I'm creating. But I, what I did was I, instead I set up a, uh, I used Logical Volume Manager, uh, and now I can take advantage of, and it's working great, by the way. I, I've um, sent a um, um, PDF up on the platform. For folks to grab if you want to set this up it's a diy project it shows you exactly how to do it and um and so what i did was i researched logic volume management and i set that up and so now instead of a three terabyte nas i've got a six terabyte nas and so um what i wanted to do was go out to um i want to share my screen if if you got a moment i'll share my screen and show you what it looks like in Open Media Vault. Uh, so let me see if I can share my screen. And if I remember last time we had problems with sharing the screen on the entire screen for some reason. Window, entire screen. You click it and to share. Okay. We should be looking at... Everybody, everybody see... Wait a minute. Everybody see my Open Media Vault? Uh, yes. Okay. Give me one second. You should see this. You see like a spinning drive? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's what it is. Here's my Open Media Vault applications at 192.168.1.125 on my network. And let me get into it. Here it is. All right. Everybody see the Open Media Vault screen? Yep. 
Okay. If I go to storage, what I had to do was I had to um, actually set up a service, but I'm not going to show you that. I set up LVM, which is logical volume management. And if you real quickly, if you don't know logical volume management, it consists of like three parts, physical volume, the volume group, a VG, and then an LV, which is the logical volume. And you have to set up the take the two physical volumes, which are the two, three terabyte drives, and um, and then you create a volume group from the two drives, and then you create a logical volume. So the system sees the uh, entire setup as one drive, not two drives. And so it looks like the, here's the physical volume of two three terabyte drives. All right, and then the volume group that was set up, this is the six terabyte volume group set up of the two drives, dev SDA and dev SDB. And that was the volume group one that was set up. And uh, then I created the LV1, which is the logical volume. And so if I go in here and go to the logical volume, you can see the logical volume here of LV1 of six terabytes. Okay. So that's, that's the setup basically in a nutshell, in Open Media Vault. Now, to prove that it works, proof of, of, of uh, content here, I'm going to go to my Thunar file manager and expand it to full screen. You can see what I've done is, in addition to the logical volume management, within Open Media Vault, I use the network file system. I got away from uh, SMB CIFS, this, the uh, um, the way the Samba basically is what it is that uh, Microsoft uh, Corporation developed Samba, and that's the uh, server message blocks uh, common internet file system. The problem with that Samba is, and it was developed by the way, so that Microsoft uh, Windows platforms could communicate with over the network with Linux boxes. And so, but the problem with it is, is it, it can be somewhat unstable at times and it was falling out uh, or stopping working <laughs> gene uh, from time to time. And, um, and so I got away from it and went to a tried and true Unix based uh, system that Linux adopted, which is the network file system. So I set up network file system and I created an, a share called LV1 share. And there it is right there. And so if I click on it, you can see here that I've already got things stored in that volume. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and uh, open a new window. And uh, let me minimize this window and minimize this one. And so you've got two windows now. And I'm assuming you can still see my window. Yeah. Okay. And so you've got two windows now. This is my, um, oh, I got them switched. Let me move them around. Give me a second. I like to be, I'm left-handed. So, um, all right. So here's my, my Western Digital Network Attached Storage. It's a four terabyte RAID 1. And I'm just going to go into, uh, let's say, videos. And let's go down to, let's say, aviation. And here's my favorite favorite guy, Citation Max. And so I'm going to pick a video here, and I'm going to go into um, my archive documents, which I've got a subset of LV1, which is the NAS share, 6 terabyte. And <clears throat> I'm going to go into home directory and videos. And I'm going to take one of these videos here and just pull it down. And you see how fast that is. Okay, so it's copying over that video to my network attached storage, which is the six terabyte storage from my four terabyte RAID 1 storage. All right, and so it is a pretty large file. So it's going to take a few minutes, a few seconds. Dan, question. Yep. yep. So how many hard drives do you have altogether in this process? You, you have three? 
Um, no, I've got, and it's doing a comparing checksum right now, which is nice. Thunar does that. Um, no, I have two, Steve. I've got two, three terabytes spinning 7,200 RPM drives, Western Digital Black, and they are sitting in a two bay enclosure and they are set up as two physical volumes with a volume group I created, with a logical volume I created from the volume group that is seen by the system as one drive, which is this drive right here. LV1 okay, let me, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're copying something from a four terabyte drive to the to the logical volume six terabyte drive, right? it sounds like there are three drives. Two oh, of the drives well, okay. Are All right, well, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the uh, four, for four terabyte RAID 1 NAS is a separate NAS altogether. It's a uh, Western Digital okay. NAS running, op it's kind of running an operating system called uh, operating system five. And that's a separate box altogether, Steve. It's not connected to mod up what I've been doing okay. with, with the uh, two drive enclosure. And so what I did was, and it's all connected to across the network, of course. And it's using opens, uh, open operating system five, rather. The NAS I created is using network file storage or network file system, rather, uh, NFS. And so I'm able to copy files from the RAID 1 NAS to my newly created NAS, uh, as I'm showing you here, using Funar as the file manager in media uh, MX Linux. Which is what I'm on on the desktop. Understand? Got it. Okay. But far as drives go, I've probably got I've got four internal drives to my computer, including my internal hard drive, and then I've got the two network attached storage drives outside of the computer, one a RAID one and one uh, LVM. So I've got a lot of storage. I've probably got all together, I would say probably close to 15 terabytes of storage for my whole system, which is far more than I'll ever use. <laughs> all right, anybody see that? I'm gonna go ahead and unshare. Anybody, any other questions about it? All right, no questions, I'll just go stop sharing. Let me get back to Dan, um Yep. Uh, what flight simulator are you using, and do you like it? Flight simulator? Yeah, there on on that those files were uh, MP4s of land uh, of aircraft landings. And, oh no, and, those are those are um, YouTube videos. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, let me get back into the meeting. Here we go. Right. Um, those are YouTube videos. I I follow about four or five aviators on YouTube and I archive their videos uh, when I can. The ones I like, uh, Premier One Driver and uh, Citation Max and a few others. Uh, they're really good aviators. All right, and uh, other than that, that's about all I've been working on as far as Linux goes. Been following Steve's report about the K, about the um, XZ utils. I just posted a Reuters article about it this morning on the platform and I mean it's it's a um, it's a bugaboo It's I'm glad the guy caught it because that could have been a big major problem Yeah, I think that's worth um, a bit of a diversion because that that you know Like your the article you you sent says it it's it's a it's was definitely a near you know near miss um, Oh, yeah. For us, uh, if it hadn't have been caught and it got, because I, I mean, every one of my systems has that package. So if it had proceeded to be production code in the various systems that use it, it could have been an absolute, you know, nightmare. Yep. Um, which of course for me just means don't be on the bleeding edge. Um, but it's not like, but it's that's not the that's not the entire solution because it does take somebody finding this code. Yeah. um for you know, for it to happen and yeah there's a lot of people a lot of eyes on this code but you know there's also a lot of people just using code and trusting it and not you know it stuff can stay out there it it it, it probably stay out stayed out there longer than it, it even should have so you know what 
what does that mean to y'all? Um, what, how are you doing things differently? What does, does this give you pause um, as far as how you operate your um, open source systems? Well, I, I'm going to respond to that initially here if I can. Um, um, it doesn't, doesn't force me to distrust open source any more than I do now, which is I trust open source. But uh, I think that what we need to do is I think that developers in the open source community need to take a harder look at who they trust and find ways to mitigate this problem so it doesn't happen again. I mean, they, they need to, to find ways to, to do checks and balances on people who are given a lot of trust in publishing code. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And there needs to be maybe two sets of eyes looking at before a commit goes forward instead of just one set. I know that's double work, but, um, you know, and I'm not a programmer. I mean, I guess I am a programmer, but I'm not a developer, put it that way. So, um, yeah, because I, I program in Python and in PHP, but what do you, what do you guys think of that? I, I mean, that's my take on it. I, I think we also need to be careful and and uh, make sure that our you know the XZ utils though is present probably in just about every Linux system out there, and you know as long as you keep your security patches up and everything that's fine. But this thing would have gotten through with all security patches in place because it was somebody who went in and maliciously altered code or injected code rather to do nefarious things, you know, and, and that's just, I guess, the world we live in today. Yeah, I had, uh, I, uh, I see this as a question of whether this is basically uh, something being set up for use in cyber warfare yeah. uh, by, by a nation state, uh, because they said this was uh, something carefully done over a couple of years and not with a ransomware or a monetary, an obvious monetary uh, goal uh, to begin with, um, although we can't be sure of that. Um, Likely but, not you know, one individual either. Yeah. I mean, the fact that one individual is, is named as the developer doesn't mean that there was actually one person who was, who was that individual. But I noted that Russia and China several years ago, I think, were starting, they had made their own Russian, their own national versions of, the, of, uh, of Linux. And I'm wondering if they have national repositories hmm. so that they could, you know, theoretically, if they wanted to affect the rest of the world, that uses the uses the global repositories for major distros, um, they would not be affected uh, by that, uh, and and uh, so I'm assuming that the U.S. is doing some and other nations are also doing the same thing in a sense, and that's very different than looking at uh, you know either accidental bugs or uh, deliberate malicious. Uh, stuff or exploits intended to uh, get you money. Um, I don't think, you know, I think it's just another form of, of uh, if it's another form of warfare or, or pre-warfare preparation, I think the countries involved will not, will harbor the individuals like Russia seems to be, and China both seem to be harboring people who have been associated with, with ransomware. So I, I don't, you know, it's not like the uh, there's a central group that can say these are the rules for development uh, uh, when it comes to the to some each distro has its own repositories. I think, you know, whether they like Antix uses Debian because it's a fork of Debian, but it also has an Antix uh, repo. It's it's very difficult because the system was not devised devised with security in mind, and to retrofit it to be secure is is going to be difficult. I'm way but lot, lots of eyes. I think that's the main thing. Lots of eyes is the best protection we have yeah. at the moment. I'm way behind on this. Uh, can anybody shoot me a URL that I can look at to see what you're talking about? Yeah, you're not on the platform, right, Gene? That's I'll put uh, a probably not. I'm on the art. I put an article up there. To, to oh, okay. Well, 
I mean, I can shoot you that article if you want me. Yeah, to. that'd be great if you could. Okay. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to take the group time up uh, trying to catch up, but uh, Gene, sounds interesting. Yes. It was also it was also made the New York Times. They had an article that said, "Did this one man save the internet?" Yeah. It was in the last week. So if you just uh, Google that, you can read it. That's that's a uh, names the guy and lords him. In spite of the fact that he works for Microsoft. Yeah. San Franciscan based Microsoft employee. Microsoft <laughs> saves, saves Linux. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Microsoft. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, end of this. Although it's been the other way around for the last few years, hasn't it? <laughs> God, they, you know, they, there's, there's a lot of friendship between, you know, those two realms now, for sure. Uh, the, the very short description is there is a, a, a library, a, a, a package, um, and I, I don't know the specific files, but I think it's the XVUtils package, which is a compression, like think like gzip or something like that. It's like yep. a gzip alternative right. um, that's present in every, pretty much every system. It's it's in the base system for just about everything, um, and a one of these packages has malware in one of its most recent versions. Mm. Um, I didn't read too much on how it got there, but that that is basically the, anyone who's like running complete bleeding edge Debian and taking the updates very aggressively theoretically could have gotten this. Um, uh, or I think Fedora uh, was the other one mentioned. So, you know, if you're being extremely aggressive on how you get updated, which I, I'm going to say before I say this, I'm really thinking out loud here. I'm not stating a belief or an opinion, but I do wonder if it's this 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 sort of thing may change the way we see updates, because especially in the Microsoft world, like you know the 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 the, the chant of of security is update 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 patch patch patch, um, and if patching is perhaps not always safe. Um, I mean, you can look at that and say, like, there's commercial software, like, most notably something we used was um, uh, Sorwins. Several years ago, it had a security issue. Um, we weren't actually subject to it, but we got spooked up, spooked enough that we just immediately stopped using it. Um, it you know, just in case things were worse than it initially appeared. Um, and we went away from it for several years before finally coming back to it after the dust had settled, figuring they've probably learned their lesson and probably have, you know, done more in that realm than most companies do. So maybe they are a better solution um, than others. Um, because for one, if, if it happens again to them, they're probably done as an organization, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fool me once, shame on me, that sort of thing. But uh, we we focus so much, and I will let you speak, Steve, uh, once I finish this thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you finish. Uh, I, uh, I do wonder if we're going to shift the notion away from, you know, patch, patch, patch to sort of like more behavior-based detections and sort of frozen, like, we really do think this particular collection of software is secure for at least what we're using it for. Because one thing you'll you'll end up do you'll take patches for everything in the Microsoft world or the Linux world. I do. I mean, I patch all the software, but am I using all that software? Do I truly need to patch things that I are on my base system, but none of my pack, none of my pr production apps use it? So if I'm I'm just running nginx on a web server for as a proxy it's doing a very small thing and one thing of course is to uninstall the software i'm not using but that becomes a very that becomes a management headache um because you have to end up with very dissimilar systems um but like should you update things that are never used i mean if it does does a vulnerability in a piece of software that is completely outside the role of the server justify updating that package when it will never be used in the way where it becomes vulnerable. So I, I wonder if it's gonna, in some ways, if this happens again and again, change the behavior um, of organizations, especially when it comes to you know, critical systems of, of how they operate in this way. Because a lot of my Linux systems I've 
you know, I do updates, but my primary security focus is is a tax surface reduction, only installing what is, you know, the bare necessities to make the system run and to do the thing it's supposed to do. All right, sorry, Steve. No, um, I was going to speak to the point that I have a, one. One of my systems is a SID system, and it's it's a toy. Um, so I've learned, and I'm running it on a no system D uh, distro, and that means that I have to. I'm getting 20, 30, 40 upgrades potentially on a single day, and I have to keep upgrading or deciding whether I want to upgrade something. Um, so. I have to go through a process of checking to make sure I'm not moving a particular package from a no system D version, which was customized to avoid system D dependencies, um, that an upgrade from Debian comes along and it'll just, you know, say you want to upgrade this. So I have to check that. So I've learned to put into effect a routine and that's especially an issue with with SID because the upgrades come so so many upgrades come and the reason so many upgrades come daily is because it's an early upgrade it's a test and a lot of times the developer finds there are still bugs in it or there are new bugs and so the next day they come out with another upgrade for the same thing so in the course of one week you may see two or even three upgrades for the same package so uh, because it's a no system D um, uh, fork of Debian, um, I become, you know, happily paranoid about avoiding problems. And I think that is uh, maybe one, one thing that people can do when they're doing an upgrade. It's a lot easier with the stable version where you may get one or two upgrades uh, every three or four days and nothing in between. Uh, now this is on an end user system where there's a lot of stuff if you just installed a full version because you have a choice of a net, for, in Antics, you have a choice of a net version, a core version, a base version, or the full version. Each one in, in order has more packages. Once packages are installed, apt, apt upgrade you know, will tend to display a whole bunch of packages, including things you may never be using. So if you can start, if you can start with a minimalist system, building up from the net system, and then uh, courageously uh, uh, not add anything, it makes your life easier. But even with that, I've got stuff on the system that this system is not going to use. It's a a BIOS-based uh, system, not an, a UEFI system. And yet somehow EFI Boot Manager got onto this system. Well, I'm not bothering to upgrade it because I, I can't use it. I never use it. Um, so that basically is the message that this, this may be a, a call for the individual user who has a lot of stuff on the system that may come in automatically when they do an install to basically um, try to use a tool like Aptitude or Synaptic as a careful check. If they're only going to be looking at two or three packages being upgraded every two or three days, it should be fairly easy to check the dependencies and at least that to see that it's not going to gum up anything. Obviously, that's not going to enable the average end user to say, uh oh, this software looks like it might have malware in it. Uh, they're not going to have the ability to look at the source and understand it. Even if you can look at the source, you have to be able to understand it and be able to thresh through it and say, there's something funny here. Uh, and for you, Brent, and this is a question back to you, because I think you're talking in good part also about setting up servers, which in that case, they tend to be more minimalistic, and so there is a little bit of protection there. The, the downside is, of course, that a server can affect multiple, multiple other systems. And I, that's it. Yeah, I, I use, I, like I said, I do focus on attack surface reduction, but I don't take it to its logical extreme, which I sometimes wonder if I should. So what I do for a Debian system 
is I install the the bare minimum system, um, which is, you know, not the bare minimum it is needed to run, but it's basically the bare minimum that it offers as an install. And then I install stuff on top of it. And that's been working great. It's not, you know, it doesn't make my life any harder to do it that way. But theoretically, I could look at that system and say, okay, I don't need these packages that you've installed for me um, and, and rip them out as part of my image creation. And the, ni the nice thing about working in a server environment, I don't have to do this again and again, because once I have what I like, I can um, make a template of it for my virtual machines. And I don't, and when I create a Linux virtual machine, I don't start from an installer, I start from a template. So I basically have an installed machine that's ready to go. All I have to do is assign it an IP address and start installing software, you know, okay, an IP address and a host name, um, and then start installing software. Uh, but like I said, I could theoretically strip it down to beyond what it does. Also, as far as updates, um, I am kind of trusting the process. Uh, I, I may move away from that. You know, right now, I'm using the the, the installers within the, the process, but um, there are some notions of moving towards a an update server um, that we are using for the, the Windows world. So there's going to be a different, you know, a, a different place where we look at the updates, we say, okay, this gets approved, this gets approved, this gets approved, they get deployed instead of just saying, you know, uh, apt update and and apt, you know, just upgrade. Dan? Yeah, I was going to say, um, echoing what uh, something you said, Brent, and then Steve followed on. In the Windows world, what you're talking about there is in the Linux world is done by using Ansible and Kubernetes. Um, but what I don't understand in the Linux world is whether we have the ability to do what they do in the enterprise for Windows, which is a Windows update server. You know, an enterprise takes updates from the from Microsoft and they review those before they parse them out to everybody. So why doesn't the Linux world use a Linux update server to do the same thing for us? And that would help us out. The other thing that um, that maybe they do that, and I just I'm not aware of it. But the other thing I wanted to mention is if anybody's concerned about this recent um, uh, malware injection, you can look to see what version of XZ utils that you have on your system. There's a command that lets you do that. Uh, Chris Skyard, who is a guy that uh, is a member of our group, I'm going to have coffee with him here at the end of uh, the month at a local coffee shop, and he's the one who posted that. I don't know if everybody saw it, but if you have version 5.6.0 or 5.6.1 of XZ Utils, you are probably potentially susceptible. If you have anything else, you're not. Well, I checked mine, and I'm 5.4.1. I'm running MX Linux, which is based on stable uh, Debian, and so you're not, I'm not going to get the you know latest and greatest um, 5.6. I'm going to get 5.4.1, which is what I have. So anyway, that's that's one thing you can do. Just do an XZ um, utils dash dash v for capital V for version, or the da or dash capital V or dash dash version and check your version and see what you have. And uh, that should help you out there too. That's all I got. Uh, I wonder, just throwing, throwing two cents in there. Uh, my Android phone uh, says these apps are slated for deep sleep. And I wonder, uh, you know, looking at the other end of it, uh, where you're constantly updating uh, things that you don't use, if something like that could be done with uh, with the Linux OS, where, say, uh, if you haven't used something since you've in, since you installed the the uh, OS, 
if that can just be put into some sort of a deep sleep and not be uh, not be updated further. Just deselect it. There's a you know you can do that in your aptitude command to deselect yeah. a, a package, yeah. not to update it. Yeah, but I want it all done for me and yeah. you know, spoon fed to me. <laughs> de, de, um, Gene, That's just the kind of guy I am. Gene, yes. in the in the Linux world, at least with Debian, uh, when you do an apt update and apt upgrade, um, is usually a listing uh, with a considerable, in my case, a considerable number of packages. It says these are no longer being used. So use sudo auto remove to get rid of them. So at least that part of it. Where, yeah. the, where app sees it as no longer necessary because they've been superseded by other packages you've installed, it'll tell you that. It won't tell you if you haven't used, for example, LibreOffice Writer for, for four months, it won't say to you, you know, you haven't used LibreOffice Writer for four months, you, maybe you get rid of it and you'll re, you know, regain a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of megabytes. Well, mine, when I do that, uh, the auto remove function, you know, the, the message that comes up, it's never any more than old Linux kernels in my system. So that's, that would be the only thing. And, and, you know, that's kind of meaningless when it comes to uh, the problem that you guys are talking about. Sorry. I <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, try, that's, try to help. The kind of thing, that's the kind of thing that I was that I was pitching, but you know what what you just said is that it doesn't do stuff that you haven't used for four months, and it doesn't do this and it doesn't do that. Make it do that. Um, they, there may be programs I want to use occasionally. I mean, maybe I'm going to use Gparted. Um, well, then you bring that months. in and, and update it. You update it to the current version or whatever. Oh, well, I, if I can, I'm keeping them all updated as long as they look like they're not moving from no system D to, to system yeah, D versions. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like they're safe in terms of nothing pops up when I do the upgrade saying uh, simulate the upgrade. You know, you do apt upgrade in the Debian world and it doesn't do the upgrade. It just says this is what's going to happen. And then if it says, by the way, we're going to remove 16 packages, which happens, uh, this is the package I could upgrade. And if I do that, it's going to remove my printing packages, cups, a bunch of cups. And I said, I don't know why it wants to do that. And I think I might not have printing after that. So I guess I won't upgrade that package. So it's sitting there until a, uh, I understand that I don't need the other nine packages. Uh, which I think I do need, um, or until a new version comes out, which doesn't tell me to what, that the other ones are going to be removed automatically as part of that install. That put everybody to sleep. Yeah. I was just typing back to Gene. All right. Well, we can come back to this, but I want to make sure we get around the room. So, Steve, you got anything else going on this month? Um, well, it's it's a long term project. You know, one of the things I understood about insecurity was that there's an exploit. Uh, a botnet was set up uh, using Edgewater Edge Router uh, X routers by a Russian group, and the FBI broke it, and they actually reset. The, uh, the passwords and such for the victims and presumably notify them. They said most of the people with Edge Router X uh, and routers who were victims had not changed the default username and password. So I know I changed it. So I haven't looked. The FBI, as far as I know, has neither modi modified my, my username and password or or notified me. So I'm assuming that I'm not part of a Russian botnet. But if you get funny Russian messages after this meeting, then I'm, I apologize. Steve, you're probably the NSA will probably get to you. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, actually, there's a newer group, right? It's the CISA, you know, yeah, which, right. which is getting uh, good reviews, at least from Steve Gibson. I haven't. And, you know, so this was publicized by 
the FDA, uh, the FDA, the FBI, uh, <laughs> or by CISA directly. Um, you know, they announced that they had broken the botnet and they had done this, that, and the other. Um, so hopefully, if there's anybody else out there who's using an Edge Router X, uh, you're not still a residual member of my. Uh, <laughs> Leander's got has a nice comment there. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. He, he's he thinks the Chinese guy is actually working for it. I wouldn't the doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it at all. Well, that would be great, <laughs> but I hope it works in the Russian and the Chinese repositories, because that's my thought that having your own national, um, you know, distribution, uh, it still requires that you have national repositories so that you keep you keep your system clean while you destroy other people's systems and of course then the the fbi or the nsa can go and attack those repositories by sending somebody in presumably with a russian or chinese name to work as a developer in the same way and maybe they've done that well, uh, the so Russians don't do that for see. me the question <laughs> is about a router yes of course not damn uh for me the question for a router is there's there's two ways of looking at it um, three. One is um, imagine yourself as an enterprise and get the fanciest enterprise router and spend, if necessary, four or five thousand dollars, and then you can do everything with it, and even hire somebody to make sure that anything you can't do, uh, they can do. And and as long as you have enough money and you're crazy, uh, you could do that. And then the other two versions are to use a typical uh, consumer advertised router, which gets good reviews from. Um, what are the uh, uh, PC mag or other such journals basically on the, on the basis that they have uh, the right um, software, firmware and performance, <laughs> uh, or you can go the route of being a paranoid security nut uh, who says consumer routers tend to be insecure. Some in some ways are based on their hardware and in some ways based on their firmware and software and um, lack of adequate update or demanding that you have insecure setups in order to manage the router. So, yes, that's enough. Dan is going to suggest that. That's great. Uh, the, uh, so, so as I posted, I'm, there are two routers. There's a site called routersecurity.org which focuses on this problem and kind of they've recommended two routers that are not uh, mainstream um, consumer routers. One from a company called, I think it's called Pep Link, although they have a router called Pep Wave also. And the other uh, from a uh, company that produces a router called PCWRT and the PC stands for parental control. And I'm you know, just tossing in my mind which one I want to try, uh, it, my, my current setup is so minimal, uh, so primitive, so old, that almost anything I buy at this point would be um, ahead of it in speed, both um, uh, you know, on Wi-Fi and, and by Ethernet too. Uh, and we're not having great problems, so I don't need a massive performance improvement. I would just like to figure that, that maybe I'd get something that because of the philosophy, would be uh, satisfying to me from a security point of view, especially when people are muttering about all these new threats. And that's all I have this month. But if anybody has advice and wants to communicate with me, I'd love it. You know, if they tell me about the problems they've had with their routers or the successes, that they've installed their own firmware, they've done their security updates, their mavens about this, to use a Yiddish term, then um, I, I would love to get uh, get this somewhere via the email or however and that's my month all right thanks steve i think gene wanted had something well, to say uh, and yeah, can go ahead and just do his kind of thing. circling back to the uh to the problem that uh that they reported uh my understanding of malware and admittedly my understanding is very flawed but uh doesn't malware have to be executed by the user computer or can it be activated like without any sort of uh yeah okay so that answers that question yeah yeah that you know let me just say that the magic word is remote 
if you have malware that you install on a computer, but you have to be at the computer and uh, physical access, that's considered much less of a threat. So the really bad ones are those, and this is one of them, that you can get at remotely. But I, I do think it needs to be said that something has to initially kick off that software. It's got to be running in it, either itself or within something. It, it has to be activated. It can't, I mean, malware just sitting on a drive isn't particularly useful. Um, but in the, in, in the world of something where it's a library, it could be running in, in half a dozen different places because of, of various different pieces of software that use it and you're not even aware of it. Yeah, I, yeah think well, I think the library has to be running, um, yeah. and it's, but if the library is so universally going to be running much of the time on many, 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 many computers, then this thing can remotely access it without having to go no user or password. That's my understanding, that even if it's not intended, I, I guess if it's not facing the internet, then it can't get to you if it's you're not connected well, yeah. but we're talking about the internet connected things because the guys who are living somewhere and have a computer without connection to the internet are probably very few yeah i mean it's remotely executed is the thing about this deal and it's also allows remote control once it's executed yeah on the computer yeah root level right <clears throat> All right, Gene, did, what else did you have this month? He's met, muted. Gene, Gene is muted. Uh, I'm not handling the technology very well. Okay. <laughs> there we are. Dan. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, just... Not much on Linux, but going through some pretty big life changes. I'm getting ready to uh, to vacate my house and place out here in uh, Barnyardsville, as Dan calls it. And uh, uh, so I've, I've contracted with an auction company to come in and auction my uh, belongings. So anyway, I'm stripping down to the bare bones, and I'm. Ed, if you're listening, uh, uh, let me know about Rolling Green Estates, if there's anything down there that uh, looks good. So. What are you telling us, Gene? I'm just saying that I'm, uh, I'm got some big life changes coming. You know, you, we were talking about your big life changes. And yeah. You know, yeah. those are mine. So that's pretty much it. All right. Thanks, Gene. Um, Santiago Santiago usually has to leave early, so let's talk to him before he's got to go. <laughs> yeah, um, you know I haven't really done too much on uh, on my side of the uh, Linux and stuff like that recently because I've been going through some stuff, you know, outside of the internet and stuff like that. Um, I am thinking about those starting a project with a NAS system, trying to make a something with media. If I I forgot really what it was, but it was uh, I'm gonna want to do something with a NAS system. Sorry. We're getting a NAS and um, working on something with that. But um, yeah, I, haven't, I mean, other than from who knows other things, I've also been like, you know, traveling quite a bit. I've been, um, I just got back from California. So I was doing that for a little while. So I've just been, I guess, busy outside of the uh, side of the internet and um, Linux on my Linux sites. But I do want to start getting back into that. I actually, uh, well, I actually have a course that I was going to, I was working on at the time uh, to help me prep up for something with CompTIA um, uh, certification because I want to I want to see how that will go. Um, but I haven't. Um, but I, I like I said, I've been a little bit busy on that. But I want to start getting back into that as I've got more time now. But yeah, um, I guess that's basically all I have. I have really done the last, actually not for just in the last month, the last several months. You know, I've just been busy and. Um, you know, working on stuff outside of, uh, outside of this, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to start to, uh, work more on that. And, um, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens from there, but you know, that's basically all I have to say, I guess, for the time being. Oh. 
All right. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something that Santiago is working on that he didn't mention, and I hope he doesn't mind if I mention it. Uh, he and I have been talking, and um, Santiago's got an inroad to a, a very active uh, YouTuber by the name of Jailer Croy. I don't know if much, much of you know about him, but he owns his own company called uh, LearnLinuxTV.tv, and uh, very active Linux professional. I mean, he's, he, this guy is top notch. And uh, Santiago uh, is working on trying to get him to come in to give us a presentation. So I think yeah. that that would be wonderful if we could do that and get that to happen. Yeah, yeah, that like would be I, awesome. yeah, like I said, I will try doing my best what I can. I got a, I did make a draft of the email. I'll say, Dan, I just haven't okay. uh, put in that part yet, but I, I'm gonna, I'll send you a draft of what I say in that part once I get, okay. the, once I write it in, which will, I'll start working on um, when I get a chance. Which hopefully will be today. I'll, I'll, I'll see, right. I'll see what I can work on. And Brent, so that you know, I was, you know, I was thinking along the lines of perhaps. Jay LaCroix could come in and do like a, a you know, a one hour presentation on Kubernetes or Ansible or something like that. I think that would be wonderful for me anyway. I don't know about the rest of you guys if you want to know anything about Kubernetes. I certainly <laughs> could stand to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Santi. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. Um, Alan, what do you got going on? Uh, just uh, trying to work out various issues that crop up uh, on a daily basis. Uh, for example, um, I use uh, FileZilla, uh, uh, File Transfer uh, Protocol, the secure version. I've got a SSH uh, security keys. Works fine. I've been using it for years. But I had a need to set up uh, another FTP uh, um, account for somebody for, that's working with me. And uh, rather than installing uh, SSH keys and all, uh, what I did is I set up on FileZilla, they have different protocols. Uh, uh, and when I, I can make the protocols work, the, the uh, uh, secure, what it does, it, um, it, it, it gives you the choice of using uh, explicit FTP over TLS, if available, or, or, or requiring um, uh, explicit FTP. And it uses uh, TLS, which is uh, transport layer security, used to be called SSL. And it's a set of security keys that uh, uh, basically encrypts that communication. And so when I set up this account for, for my the, the person I'm working with, um, they go in and can successfully log in and connect to the FTP server. But the error that ha that's occurring is it will not display the directory listings. So I get a message that it is successfully connected, and uh, but it gets stuck and will not show the subdirectory, the files in there. Uh, evidently, it's a pretty common problem with uh, uh, FileZilla, and uh, and the crux of the problem is I think that uh, there are some ports that need to be open. Uh, like it, it wants ports 889 and 900. So once it logs in, it uses the uh, uh, transport layer security uh, encryption on those ports. And I've opened them up on, on, our, on our server and no matter what I do, I cannot make that work. In, in order to uh, facilitate connecting and proper operation of displaying the files, and I have to use just uh, use plain FTP, which is insecure. That works, but it, it, you know all the user credentials are all and your your data is is displayed in the clear as as it navigates you know across the internet. 
So that's one issue I'm dealing with. Anybody has any ideas? Uh, uh, I welcome, you know, any tips. The other question I have is a, uh, is a regarding to cookies. When I am browsing the internet, and I'm seeing this much, much more frequently in the last year, and I think it's because of that European, uh, you know, uh, requirements for, for privacy issues. I'm constantly getting requests to accept uh, cookies or, or accept some cookies, and, and, but not all cookies. And I just, I'm not sure how that actually works in a browser. Because uh, when I accept a cookie, it's amazing. You know, I, I am getting emails and other and, and, and web content that is directly associated with the uh, that that website that I had visited. So I don't know how that works. If anyone knows how that works, it'd be great to learn. Oh. Um, Alan, maybe tangential to what you're saying when you say works, because there's two separate things here. One is that you can reject, um, you can deny all on some sites, you can reject all but non all but essential cookies. So that's one thing to minimize that. Um, the other thing is what I understand again from Steve Gibson is that Google and people here can can correct me. Google is sponsoring a an approach to non-identifying individuals and um, individually when you go to sites, and they're promoting that for at least their their browser. Uh, and the idea there is that that would tend to eliminate these follow, I believe that it would tend to avoid targeting you. Um, it's complicated and I can't, I, I don't understand it. Some, I don't understand it hardly at all. And I don't understand it uh, enough certainly to make any sensible comment. Uh, if Dan is going to explain it, that's great. I see his hand is up. No, he's not. Okay. Is that part of the incognito program from Google? Uh, it, yes, I believe so. Yes, thank you, Gene. And I don't understand that too well either, except that it's supposed to free one. It doesn't mean that you won't still end up in your browser with a whole bunch of files that are cache files from your browsing activity. But that's I not just what you're do not about. understand the mechanism of yeah. how they uh, remotely access your cookie files on your on your local computer and then advertise that out to potential advertisers or other websites it's, it's just boggles my mind how that would even work they're looking as hard as hard at you as you are at them <laughs> oh well, consequence sure. of the google thing is apparently that websites now are saying uh you'll have to sign in where before, you know, you would just be browsing and click and you'd see something and they'd automatically get information on you through the cookie mechanisms. Anyway, that's what I've been up to. Um, that's about it. Dan? Yeah, I just want to make a comment on something that it's not about cookies, but I want to make a comment on something that Alan said. You made a comment, Alan, about SSL and, and uh TLS being the same, they're not. Um, transport layer so security and socket secure SSL, secure sockets layer, they're, they operate at different layers of the OSI model. I believe uh, TLS operates at layer four. I'm not quite sure what layer SSL works, but I think it's above layer four, like layer five or six. But there are different layers, but they're, I mean, they're different protocols. They do similar things, but they're not synonymous. So make sure you understood that. Okay. It was my understanding that Netscape uh, developed the original SSL protocols. Yeah. But it's been mainly supplanted by uh, TLS at, at this yeah, point. Yeah, that's probably true. That's true. Right. Um, SSL V3, which is the final version of SSL, is deprecated on just about everything. Um, you, you know, you're not supposed to use it. In fact, TLS 1.0 and 1.1 1 
shouldn't be used either. Everything should be TLS 1.2. Um, and when people say commonly SSL, what they really mean is is TLS. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, whether I mean they're not synonymous, but in practice, I mean the the in 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 common parlance, say they, they're essentially the the same thing. When people say SSL, they really mean TLS. When old folk folkies like me say SSL, I'm really mean, meaning TLS. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying Alan's an old fogey? <laughs> um, the shoe fits. <laughs> the orthopedic shoe fits. You can tell the old fogies we have beards. <laughs> White ones for the most part. That's true. <laughs> Ed is rubbing his chin now. <laughs> There's another old fogey. <laughs> So Ed, what's going on? Uh, Other than your mute button. <laughs> Live streaming is on. Oh, was that not on all that time? Nope. Yes, start over. <laughs> oh, I was saying that my primary system died and I had to replace it. So I did a quick interim replacement buying a system off of... Um, eBay from some company that refurbishes business systems. And it was a Dell Optiplex uh, 704 small form factor. It came pre-installed with Ubuntu. So I left that on there for a while just to try Ubuntu because I haven't tried it in probably over a decade to see how it's changed. And I played with it and I said, it's interesting, but I don't want it. And then I, I overwrote that with Linux Mint, which is my preference, uh, XFCE. I'm old school, so I like XFCE. <clears throat> so I have not made that my primary system yet, but I probably will. In the interim, I fixed my primary system. It was um, it was an SSD drive that died three months after I bought it. And so never again will I buy some off-brand. I will always buy Samsung in the future. So I have got that back up and running again. And I'm probably going to switch to the small form vector because it's... It's pretty darn good. It's fast as Grease Lightning and paid paid the whopping sum of two hundred and ninety six dollars for it. So that's what I've been doing. All right, thanks, Ed. Uh, uh let me say make one comment to Ed. Ed, uh, regarding your ABS project, I've been watching this series called uh, Air Disasters on uh, Smithsonian Television. And most of the episodes are also on YouTube, and it's fascinating. I mean, I, if you haven't seen them, I, you, 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 I think you would uh, enjoy or at least get something out of watching some of the uh, crash, the causes of crash, and many of them involved avionics. So mm -hmm. good luck. <laughs> What's that called? Air Ambassadors? Air disasters. Oh, air disasters. Well, it yeah. is my intention that that would, what I'm working on would not cause that. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It, it, the ABS is not the cause, but it certainly could prevent, uh, you know, some uh, like TCAS and 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 other, uh, you know, uh, basically navigational uh, electronic. Well, what, what, once my nephew's product goes commercial, I'll, I'll be able to disclose all and give you a link to everything. Uh, we're getting close. We're getting extremely close now. It's around like version three of the printed circuit boards and everything is working. And now I'm having this on a new board, uh, a thermal board to protect one particular piece of his equipment that um, doesn't work well under it, under 30 degrees, minus 30 centigrade, and under minus 40, it will self-destruct even if it's turned off. So he's, he's got to have a thermal system to keep it warm enough. And I've got to detect when it's too cold and turn on the heater and monitor that. So I'm working on his thermal board now, which has to fit into a tiny, tiny little space. And, uh, 
So I'm having to learn some a different, totally different processor to work on that. I, it's the microchips AT Tiny sixteen sixteen is what I'm using. And in fact, I just got that processor working, loading a simple app in it. Just getting the um, just getting the tool chain working was quite a challenge uh, in face of poor documentation. Not, not my, not my cousin, not my nephews, but uh, microchips. Hey, Ed, I just wanted to say that you, you probably don't want to give that thermal board to NASA uh, unless you want to give it to them for the Parker probe. It might be the only thing that might work. But I wanted to just shout, do a shout out to you and, and say I applaud you for going to XFCE. Um, I use MX Linux and I use the XFCE desktop environment. And I, I really like it. It's really nice. Well, I've been using XFCE for a very long time. And I just wanted to, I've tried other things. I just don't like them. I like XFCE because it is designed to do one thing, which is to, to use my tools effectively and efficiently. And it doesn't waste a lot of, yep. a lot of my time with uh, eye candy. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna turn off my picture. I have to hold it so close to my face it looks like I'm staring into the camera. I'm looking. I'm using my phone. We know. <laughs> we, we got the message. Yeah. All right, thanks, Ed. Uh, Larry, what do you got going on this month? Well, yeah, Alicia should be here uh, possibly soon. I'm not having my Linux seems to be working well. I mean. Uh, I don't usually leave it on, but maybe one computer all the time, and I'm connected to the internet all the time. This laptop I just boot up just before I'm using it, like for this meeting, and so everything, I don't have a lot of cookies and all kinds of stuff like that, it just boots up sort of basics, and that's, maybe that's why everything works for me. Not browsing around, downloading all the crap that you get from a browser. But uh, one one comment, Gene said something about the moderator for this meeting, and I noticed that if I try to connect to this meeting like five minutes before twelve, sometimes or a little earlier, nobody else or anybody else is connected. It says me says you get a message that the moderator is not connected. And to log in if you want to be the mod be a moderator or something like that. And I just wait till so somebody must be the moderator here, according to Gitsy. Uh, I don't know if it's Gene or Brian or whoever, but it's, it's not me uh, as far as I know, and I'm didn't really want to be the moderator either. I think it's one of those things where if you look around, Larry, and nobody else is doing it, then it's you. That's exactly so, right. They've changed their program. Gitsy has. Okay, well, that's that's it for me for right now. I might make some more comments later. All right, thanks, Larry. Uh, as far as uh, moderator, when I join, I don't do anything special, but I do use the app. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, and as far as I know, like everybody has the same capabilities to like um, mute everybody else. And I mean, I assume they do. I don't know. I, I'm only ever capable of me and me. So um, I, as far as I know, there's, it's, it's a completely democratic system, but um, I, I have been using solely the, the app as of late. Yeah. Well, the way it works, Brent is, is if when you, when you come up and join, it'll ask you, it'll say that, that there is no current moderator. Do you want to wait for a moderator? And if you say, no, I want to go ahead and join, you become the moderator. That's the way it works. So I assume somebody, somebody is impatient enough that they become yep. the moderator. They become before. the moderator. That's right. Oh. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Arnold will be uh, quiet as always, but he did say hey and says he's using Mint um, and uh, has cast some aspersions on those uh, not doing so. That, that's that's an, that's an extreme statement. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 
Leander, what you got going on? Uh, this month's been pretty busy. Um, oh, at work and stuff as usual. Um, and I've been sick twice. I had COVID, and then I've had the norovirus that's been running around the last week. So I uh, still haven't completely recovered from that. Um, but uh, before I got sick the second time, I did go out and um, I got I got my astronomy gear back together and used an open source program called Cyril to make a decent shot just of the M42 trying to get back in practice with that. Um, <clears throat> I have been um, last Friday was interesting when the XZ thing I was on a in a chat room with some Debian maintainers trying to take that apart and figure it out. And yeah, I don't know what all has been said and not said. It's just, uh, um, it's definitely sophisticated. Um, it's the neat, the interesting thing is it was keyed. And in order to get a proof of concept together, you had to replace the key, the private key in it with one of your own so you could see what it did. Um, so it's it's sophisticated. And it looks like they had intentions of protecting it, so to sell it, which makes me think state actor or um, private contractor like the NSO group that they are the ones who developed the uh, Pegasus malware. Um, but it it really doesn't fit. It it's somebody with some sophistication. So China, the U.S., or Israel probably. Um, they're the usually the big ones in that. Russia and New North Korea they tend to stick to off-the-shelf stuff they can buy off of the dark net these days. Um, they don't tend to do sophisticated things like this. So um, I don't know. That's that's kind of my thoughts on it. Um, it. Another interesting thing is I think it only triggers on RPM and deb-based distros. Um, so like even um, Arch with System D, it wouldn't trigger on. So um, it was very specifically targeted towards enterprise facing stuff. Uh, but this is why Sid and Rawhide, I would say, are not um, are not production or, and things based on Sid and Rawhide are not production uh, uh, safe. And I wouldn't use them. Uh, you know, it didn't make it into stable. It didn't make it into enterprise Linux. Um, yeah, so that's my my kind of three cents on that. I it's yeah, it's interesting. I don't think um, I don't think that closed source stuff is still somehow safer. Um, you can social engineer your way into Microsoft. You know, find get somebody into a lot of game, get a dev into a lot of gambling debt, uh, bribe someone. You know, so uh, people with these kind of resources. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really doesn't uh, doesn't really uh, um, affect them closed versus open source too much. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I would. What else did I say up here about that? I was typing away. Um, it is um, as for like the checking of patches and stuff. I, I do run a local app mirror, but that's more to save bandwidth on Debian to be a good citizen than it is to actually do any checking. I mean. I'm pretty far deep in this stuff, and I feel like I don't have the technical capabilities to sit there and verify every single patch and code that comes down. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think at some point you just kind of have to trust some of that stuff. Um, um, the uh, the question somebody had about the telling you how much you use an app and to remove it that would probably require more tele te telemetry infrastructure than most Linux distros are comfortable with putting forward outside of maybe Ubuntu and Red Hat because you know they're going to have to track that usage somewhere and tell you if you've used it so that's probably why you're not going to see that and Microsoft and Android obviously they want that data so they're going to track it for you. Um, uh, Kubernetes, yeah, I, I did do a Kubernetes study for work. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, um, I that is that is a that is a Silicon Valley solution. If I have ever seen one, I am not from an engineering standpoint. I am not that impressed with it. There's a reason why no one hosts their own Kubernetes cluster hardly, because it is the back end of it is a lot of moving parts. Um, so. Um, 
I'm impressed that it works at all, but there's definitely a reason why everyone buys Kubernetes hosting from Google or Amazon or Microsoft. Uh, so, um, and again, I've, I've, my axiom there is only fools are impressed with complexity. So, but it definitely, it definitely it's, it smells of a tech bro solution to things. Um, <clears throat> um, the cookie stuff, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of. Um, what was my? I use I was an early adopter of Ansible. Uh, we were. Uh, I had a coworker who was a big um, puppet uh, push pusher puppet person. Um, went and did the puppet training and everything. Uh, I actually adopted Ansible like 2013, 2014, because my main take from it was it was agentless. Um, I don't know if I would bother learning it these days because it's kind of on the way out. Uh, the new thing is NIX packages and. Uh, kind of stateless, uh, reproducible things. So Ansible, I think, is kind of heading on the way out. It's you're you're about ten years too late. Uh, it's still in places in a lot of it's still in a lot of enterprise. I still use it, but I'm looking more to more more towards uh, reproducible, pure cattle on every. I mean Ansible, I kind of have pure cattle going, but with Nix OS and Nix packages, you can really go pure cattle. You don't change the operating system once it's deployed. You just rebuild it. It's completely reproducible and redeploy a new image. Um, so you know, seems a bit wasteful, but it but it also means you know the thing can be read only. You don't have to you don't have to do a lot of you don't have to. It's it's just more yeah more future proof. Um, I I would still learn it. Um, I, I I do know it. I bought uh, I learned it from Jeff Geerling's book. I bought about ten years ago. I learned quite a bit from that. Um, I've also learned quite a bit from just screwing around with it at the end of the day though it all comes there's i still i still probably make more use of shell scripts than i probably should these days um but yeah um i, I mainly liked ansible because it was agentless puppet and chef and all those you had to have an agent i had a mix of hardware and os's i took over a bunch of bsd machines there wasn't a puppet agent for those uh we had a bunch of switches that you could ssh into and do things over that but you couldn't install an agent on and so ansible kind of became a one-stop shop for hey if it's got an ssh client on it uh i can or an ssh server running on it i can do things with it um and automate it to an extent um uh but yeah i think that's kind of it um uh, i've really been impressed with serial and the the output from that and these astrophotography stuff um the I guess on the XZ thing, um, outside of not running close to the bleeding edge, this is where you know getting getting obsessed with chasing new and shiny kind of bites you in the butt, right? Like, I mean, my Debian may be out of date, but by God, if there was a you know a lot of people have looked at it in the five years, so um, I kind of I kind of feel it's a bit bit more robust in that regard. The other side of that is. Um, at the end of the day, somebody with these kind of resources to pay someone for three, year, two or three years to sit there and work on a project, there ain't much you're going to be able to do to stop it. Um, it's, you know, a lot of, at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff I talk about with protecting your privacy and security is um, performative. You know, if the feds kick in your door and you wipe your hard drive, you're going to jail for data destruction you know evidence destruction you know you're they're gonna get you like i mean it's just like i mean at the end of the day whoever wants to get you wants to get you and a lot of this stuff i do i realize is a bit performative but um yeah it's somebody with these kind of pockets whoever did this thing it was like i said it was either a security research firm like nso group or somebody trying to build in a back door to sell to a government or it was a government um, just from looking at it, this wasn't some 400 pound guy sitting as basement board. So anyway, um, all yeah. right, Leander. So, so, uh, leave us 400 pound guys alone. <laughs> so, well, you know, the 400 pound hacker now is 4chan, but, um, it wasn't that guy. It was, this was, this was, um, yeah, they, they usually don't have the patience and don't have the foresight to lock it down with a key. 
like that. So this was somebody looking to use it or sell it to be used. And that's really, to me, people focus on the government agencies. And, you know, there's if you can look up the history, there have been several times when the NSA has been caught red handed trying to backdoor open source projects. And, oh, yeah. every, and everybody, everybody remembers the clipper chip in the 90s and stuff, too. <laughs> um, but the um, we need to watch private sector stuff just as much. There's a lot of money. Um, you know, it's just like when Edward Snowden um, said, you, you know, blew the lid open on the PRISM project. Well, they shut that program down and now they just buy your data from Facebook or, you know, which isn't against the Constitution. You know, it's, you know, sure. they said they can't unlawful search a seizure. They didn't say they couldn't go buy it from somebody you willingly gave it to. Um, so, uh, private industry, I think, deserves more scrutiny because there are tons of, I will say, mercenary style security researchers out there that are in it not to protect you, but for the money. And like I said, the NSO group, I mean, they sold Pegasus to Saudi. That was one of the things that got Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, Khashoggi, I may not pronounce this, but the guy, the journalist who was critical of the Saudi regime who got hacked to pieces and taken out in trash bags. Yep. That was what was used on his phone. Um, they sold it to him. They've sold it to our government and police. So the private, you know, a lot of people are like big government. I'm scared of big government. And I understand that. And I'm right there with you. But the private sector, I think, needs just as much scrutiny because they have they're completely profit motivated. And um, yeah, this this kind of reeks of a private contractor, if you ask me to a degree. So. Anyway, that's my rant. I'm kind of done. Uh, you can look at my pretty picture if you want. And um, yeah, anyway. Leander, uh, question. Yep. Are you gearing up to take pictures of the eclipse or? Um, no, I was, I hadn't made any concrete plans. I did, I went to the eclipse in 2017 as part of the physics department here. I was adjuncting at the time. Um, my, I was my side gig was I was an adjunct physics astronomy professor, um, and uh, we went down there for that. And I spent nine hours getting back from Silva to Boone, uh, which is normally a two-ish, two and a half, three-hour drive. I was in uh, that traffic. Yeah, and uh, considering I spent this week uh, where I couldn't get more than fifty feet from a toilet, um, I kind of don't want to in case. <laughs> In case I'm not quite over this stomach bug that's going around, I kind of don't want to end up 18 hours in traffic from Ohio. And it looks like it's going to be cloudy up that direction anyway. So, well, That's too bad because the you got two things going for you for this eclipse, unlike the one you mentioned earlier. And that is you've got a four-hour window, a four-hour, four-minute window to view it. And the second one is it's at the peak of the solar activity. So you're going to yeah. have an extremely good corona. We have um, the, the observatory up here. We're in like 90 some percent or 80 some percent totality. Yeah, yeah, they're setting up a hydrogen alpha scope uh, to look at the sun. Of course, you can't order hydrogen alpha scopes anywhere anymore. They've been out of stock for 12 months or more back ordered. So Steve um, could probably get you one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I would love Sorry, to go Steve. back. And, <laughs> I would love to go back and see totality, but I mean, this is probably going to be a train wreck of traffic, and I didn't, I didn't have the foresight to find a place and and get it booked up and um, um, everything this time. So we, I, the last time the department kind of took care of it, we were just like, we're sending all to see the eclipse, and I think this time they're they're not doing that. So yeah. Are yeah, I feel like this one's been hyped a lot more than the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Are you doing anything with self, Leander? With what? Uh, Southeast Linux. Uh, I submitted three talks. I haven't heard back. Uh, I'll go regardless, but I haven't heard if they've been accepted or not. Actually, that's a, I could probably check and see. Uh, but I, they said they were supposed to let us know this month what our talks were going to be. But... Um, Let's see. Golf. Editor view your proposals. Uh, nope, it still says in review. So, wow, that's crazy. They were not very well organized last year, I will say. So, I wonder if they're having more of those same issues. Excuse me. <clears throat> if they won't take you as a speaker, they do. 
<laughs> I went there last. Uh, I've spoke. I spoke there in 2022. I missed the window for 2023 just because of work stuff. But I don't know. We'll see. I submitted three. I, you know, one is my usual talk on Darktable, and you know they've got new features. I I submitted one on doing a live portrait shoot and editing with Darktable. I figure, you know, it it would be good to get people hands on things. So it could be like a laboratory workshop kind of thing. And then I, I did a thing about things that ticked me off in Linux evangelism called "You use Linux, nobody cares." Like, <laughs> like things that tick me off about like you know. My, my thought is, you know, don't tell people about the tool. Go build something with the tool and show them the result. Yeah, there That's you what go. impresses the people. Like, right. you know, like nobody cares if you bought a fancy paintbrush. People care that you painted the Sistine Chapel with Exactly. It, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, that's, that's yeah, rant over. So for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of my thing. I hope yeah, if you haven't seen Totality on an Eclipse, I very recommend it. It's a very... Uh, almost life-changing experience i don't know that's probably a bit much but it's very it's very kind of it's one of those things that uh, is just it's crazy um so well, if you I, haven't seen the great american eclipse great american solar eclipse 2024 nova pbs presentation documentary film it's about an hour long you should watch that too it's great I guess actually I've got hang on a second. Uh Pictars I I've got it archived to my NAS now and it's it's I'm gonna rewatch it. It's really wonderful. A lot of historical information and stuff. Uh yeah, there we go. So this was the setup I took to the la one of the setups I took to the last eclipse. Nice. Uh, um with this there's some other guys. We took a bunch of this is my precision I had at the time. We were running we had these bench of Dell precisions here running running the stream for the physics department. Um, that's the old head of the department, Dr. Calamai. I, th I think he wasn't the head of the department at that time. I think that was Riley. Um, but yeah, there was a whole crowd of people there. This are the little uh, projection of the eclipse through the leaves. Uh, some general pictures of people looking up. Uh, there's some stuff through the scopes. Um, that's just with my phone, I think. Um, that's in the wrong folder. Um, that was someone starting a fire with a mirror. Uh, it was more tech work. Um, there, there we go. So those are the shots I got actually during, um, right after totality or right about then. That yeah. Anyway, so yep. that's that's kind of that was a quick tour of my slides there. Yep, <clears throat> it's nice. So, but yeah. Um, clouds broke at just the right moment. So that's the thing with these things is you're gambling with cloud cover. And I think there's supposed to be a pretty good chance of it up in the Ohio Valley. Um, I was thinking about going to Leander, Texas is actually in the path of totality. And I you thought about a city going, in Texas, huh? Yeah. So I thought about going to Leander, Texas, visiting some friends in Austin, but I didn't get that far either. So, well, what about those devices, Leander, that you can put on your telescope that blocks the sun? forget what it's called yeah um i've got uh it's not within reach but i've got a bunch of those here because i've got oh, do several. You? yeah okay. that, that's actually something i bought in the last month is forget what they're called there's, there's a name for it but yeah there's solar filters you can get them made out of um well, uh, it's an, ex on. it's an extension it's it's, yeah. it's it sits away from the the telescope it blocks it's a a, a disc that blocks the <laughs> oh sun. an uh, occultation disc yeah that's yeah it. yeah you yeah. can get <clears throat> i'm not those don't do well in our atmosphere. That's what they use on like the space space telescopes because right. you don't have the atmosphere scattering the scattering the light. That's how Soho um, gets the corona pictures all the time. Okay. But, yeah. but with our atmosphere, I mean, even if you block the disc, you're still going to have the blue light scattered everywhere. Oh, okay. That, but that's why oh. an eclipse works well because the moon's outside our atmosphere. So right, right. That Rayleigh scattering is what gets you. So. Anyway. Question. Uh, yeah. For Leander. Um, I understood that there was from the New York Times that there was or would be a Nova for a while. It comes back every 88 years. Yep. Uh, are you planning uh, to uh, photograph it? I hope so. Uh, um, it should be this summer sometime, I think, or well, somewhere in a six month span. But yeah, I'll probably try to photograph it. 
Um, I've got, let's see, I can, um, I've got a couple of different tracking mounts. I don't have any pictures here with me, but I've got a couple of different, um, I've got a Skywatcher little, uh, actually I do have a picture of that here. Um, window. Which so, constellation is the Nova coming out of? Uh, I think it's in, uh, gosh, I'd have to look that up. It's to the north. It's not Ursa Minor, though, uh, but it'll be like the direction to the north. Uh, Nova, let's see. Oh, yes, Corona Borealis, yeah, the Northern Crown, yeah. Oh, okay. So, Corona okay. Borealis. Um, so I think it's going to be kind of this, this part of the sky. That doesn't really help you because you don't know what direction. But um, this is one of my uh, tracking setups here. This is just a Nikon camera with a 70 to 200 lens. That's why I took that picture with. But this is a little Skywatcher. It actually runs off of AA batteries. Um, so I just stick some rechargeable batteries in it, polar align it, and go. I've got a bigger um, equatorial mount that I also use um, for like larger scopes. That was in that picture of my c8 and stuff i've got that's a big this is the c8 here that's the big i've got a big dobsonian but that's not that's i take that out for visual stuff for clubs and um outreach at the observatory <clears throat> i've got a couple of refractors here and stuff too and i if i've got these if you um i've got some four i don't know where they are but if you have a set of binoculars you can make um you can order the material too late now but um, I've got a sheet of it, but um, then you can actually cut the, the the mylar out and put it on put it on the end caps here and make yourself a pair of magnifying solar V just out of a you know cheapy mm -hmm. set of well these aren't that cheap but you can get you know go in grandma's basement or you know given the age of anyone here your own attic and and <laughs> find an old pair of binoculars and make a solar viewer out of it so yeah. I want to make a quick comment before we close um, from the Nova film, the documentary film that I watched, I thought was really remarkable. Historically, the first time that man was able to uh, determine that solar eclipses were uh, cyclic, cyclic or cyclical, can't speak today, um, was uh, 2000 years ago, which I thought was interesting. Babylonian astronomers discovered that. Uh, and to give you an idea of how far we've come in technology, Babylonian astronomers were able to tell that solar eclipses occur all over the Earth, but they weren't able to tell where they occur. But they were able to predict uh, a solar eclipse within four hours of its occurrence. We have now been able to track the totality, by the totality path of a solar eclipse anywhere on the Earth within a band of, uh, I think, 100 feet of the actual 100% totality of the path to one-tenth of a second of its occurrence, which I think is remarkable. That's just phenomenal as far as our technology has come. Astronomy is the oldest science, um, unlike the oldest profession, I guess. But... Um... <laughs> <laughs> but it's the it's it's you know uh, it was important you know early agricultural societies exactly you know, needed exactly. to time keep know when to I'm actually I, I don't know if I would say I'm writing a book yet but I'm doing research in that direction on uh, uh, some Japanese original sources because during the Meiji period they threw out a lot of their kind of local astronomy lore and stuff and adopted the western side the meiji they just basically threw out you know in a mod modernization process threw out a lot of um their traditional stuff and adopted western practices um in an attempt to catch up to the rest of the world or as they saw it to catch up to the rest of the world and um and a lot of their old lore and stuff around around astronomy kind of went with that and old discoveries and stuff like that so I'm, i found some original sources written um pre-world war ii about that and but they're in japanese and so you know i'm kind of using my skill there i found a more modern book written by a japanese anthropology professor but it's clearly written by someone with english as a second language and focuses <laughs> exclusively on folklore it's a good it's a good text but um i kind of want to kind of want to do some more 
with bringing that to Western audiences. Because, you know, I have an astronomy, physics with an astronomy concentration undergrad, and <clears throat> our astronomical history was all Western. It was all Europe and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, people all over the world had two eyeballs, just like, Europeans did, and I figure they probably noticed patterns or um, discovered things and wrote it down too. Um, just a matter if they kept track of it. So. Yeah. Well, I have an un undergraduate degree in mathematics with a second uh, secondary degree in physics undergraduate. So. Yeah, I've got my 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 master's was in physics and engineering, and yeah, um, I need to dust off some math. I haven't done anything more complicated than algebra and. I've been kind of following your your teasers, your brain teasers there <laughs> over the week, but I generally just don't check personal email that much over the week because I am absolutely blasted at work. Although I'm I'm starting to take the UNC job didn't work out. Um, probably shouldn't have talked about hentai during the interview anyway, but um, probably not a good idea. No, I'm kidding. I, it went really the interview went really well i i kind of i thought if i was a good fit they said you know hey you're, you're a good fit but we went my guess is they had an internal candidate just um you know they sent me an email saying hey if you need if you want input on helping with research computing at app state we're more than happy you know you are such a great so it it was a mute it seemed to be friendly it wasn't like the get out of here idiot type kind of rejection so <laughs> Uh, hopefully at least open some networking doors for me there. Um, but I, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember where I was going with that, but work has just been crazy. And after, ever since then, I've been kind of like, you know, um, a lot of this, we run essentially web applications and stuff for a mid-level state university. If something goes down, the worst that happens, it's not like Brent where people might die. No pressure because you're a hospital but you know um, <laughs> yeah it's you know no one's going to die no one's going to lose a foot the worst that happens is people get a day off you know they have to go outside go get a cup of coffee if something goes down and they can't do their work for a few hours so i'm i'm kind of like pushing back on my bosses kind of like everything's an emergency attitude and being like is it really is it really this can wait till tomorrow it's fine so and trying to have a little mm -hmm. bit more sanity in my work balance so um <laughs> no pressure brent you know hey with like, robust downtime procedures no one should die um so, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe should. maybe <laughs> like the, the doctors will be working with somewhat less data uh, than they had before or, or whatever yeah. but they you know yeah you know, we, we we have procedures for working yeah. without anything um techno you know at least right. in computer technological. So well, was, it, it, Brent, at least it won't be if they die in the hospital, it sure won't be because of your department, right? <laughs> they were dying anyway. <laughs> well, listen, I, I have to say that no sometimes you, you want to get the records. Yeah. And if, the, <laughs> if the records all of a sudden are not available, uh, yeah. you may have uh, a bit of concern about what to do with the patient. Well, I mean, once upon a time, you you were in that pickle anyway, right? Um, it, it, <laughs> but yeah, you you pretty much had to rely on on word of mouth, you, you know, or or I mean, it technology is relatively new, you know, medicine is not. Um, so Brent, we haven't heard from you yet. Yeah, sorry, I talked <sighs> well, a lot. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, I mentioned a freezing issue I was having last time that plagues me often in this meeting. I may have improved upon it, but I have not made it entirely go away, but I have hints. So uh, I looked at my BIOS settings and realized that I had the option to um, dictate the amount of RAM I gave the, because it's an integrated graphics controller, because it's a relatively low end machine. So um, I, I I was allowing it to automatically allocate the RAM. So I'm like, well, maybe I will just give it all the RAM I can because I have a lot of RAM on this system, so why not? So I set it to the highest number, whatever that was. And I think maybe it's better because it has only happened once since um, in, the, say, the last month. Um, and it was just like yesterday. Um, I thought I was 
I thought I had licked it, but then yesterday it froze up on me in, in the, the typical way where I'm in a video looking at video content of some variety, either, you know, so, something that's displaying video. And usually it's like I have to actively be mousing as well for, for it to freeze. At least that's my experience. Um, and then it, but I wonder if like it's been made better. So I wonder if maybe it's a bad stick of RAM or something. So I'm going to, go back and scan my RAM and see if anything comes up. Um, but that has improved somewhat, maybe. Um, as far as routers, uh, I should say I, you know, we talk about an enterprise environment and high-end routers and firewalls and so forth. I mean, I don't know how high-end we are, but I, I'm, I've always been that guy. Um, I am, I used to be the router guy, but now I'm, I'm still the firewall guy. Um, my opinion on um, home stuff and what I do is I, I use what my provider gave me. Um, and I don't, I would not, even though I think I know things, I would not use a custom built thing for protecting my network. Um, I'm far more likely to make a dumb mistake that goes unnoticed than, say, Linksys or, or whoever would. Um, and I, I, I would be also hesitant to go with some really niche um, security uh, router provider as opposed to like a higher end, like Linksys, you know. Netgear, or whatever, whatever uh, the the main TP-Link, whatever the, the players are out there, I would rather go with one of their higher end pro products than some um, <coughs> second tier that has gotten some security accolades. Because, it, I mean, it's the many eyes thing. You know, if there's something going on in a, in a in a Linksys router that there's a million of. Um, it's going to get out there. People are going to know about it. Um, and it'll probably be, you'll get a fix for it before you're going to get a fix for the the thing that it could be broken and no one's going to know about because only, you know, dozens, hundreds of people use it. Um, so I, it, it's kind of the no one got fired for buying IBM approach, um, which is the older I get, the fewer people understand that reference because it's like IBM, they're, they're like a services company, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's the, that's the approach I take is just stay, stay within standard. Um, don't be afraid to sp spend a little extra money, but keep it, um, to what most people are doing with, you know, as acceptable recommendation. Um, don't, don't go to, don't go too crazy in any given direction. Um, XFCE, someone, yeah, Ed was uh, lauding XFCE. I've always been a fan. I installed Debian XFCE on my laptop after trying to run Debian uh, LXDE, which was not particularly featureful um, and caused me some 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 issues. Uh, XFCE is a little bit better, but one thing, like, I, and I've not spent any real time on fixing it, but like I took it to out to dinner because I was on call. And then I realized that I couldn't connect to a network with the, the tools that were built in. I couldn't just say, look for networks. I had to look at the network on my phone to see what the name of the network was and then add the network. And I don't know if it's something I just that for whatever reason doesn't come stock that I need to install, but you would expect that's fairly core functionality out of the box. I don't know why it's not present on my system. Um, like I said, I've not spent any time trying to fix it, but it just, it doesn't let me just look for wireless networks in, in the GUI. Um, when I supplied the ne open network name, I connected fine. It worked like a charm. But it was just very strange that it did not, like, I'm, I'm fine with it not offering connectivity to me randomly when I'm not even looking for it, like so many things do. But if I do want to go looking for it, 
I'd kind of like it just to find it for me and give me a list and pick off the list and have to type in a name that may or may not be, um, you know, complex and I need a, another device to actually find it. So that was weird. Um, but all other than that, uh, I do really enjoy the lightweightness of um, XFCE Debian on, on this uh, older XPS laptop I have. Um, norovirus, I, uh, I understand that's on the Appalachian Trail right now. Um, that's what I've it's, heard recently it, about it. It's ripping through ASU up here, uh, everything. About every restaurant has been closing early because their staff's all got it. Mm. Uh, it's it's everywhere up here. I don't know, you know, who knows where I've got it from. Usually it clears up in one to three days, but I'm on day five now and it's still kind of lingering uh but you have got challenges in general though right yeah i've got some like ibs issues so i think i think that's kind of stacking things so yeah mm. steve muted. muted muted man yes who's uh you you rose your hand Okay. Raise your hand. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that was before about the Nova, but let me mention about the router. One thing when we talk about router hardware is that it exists because it's uh, um, electrically cheaper to run uh, than a full computer. I know Dan had mentioned, well, you know, just use an old computer that you're not using uh, to do that. Uh, or, you know, the Linux router, you can make a router out of a lot of different hardware devices. And the idea is that the simple ones that don't use a lot of electricity are just basically cheaper. Um, to the extent, I'm not an expert, but I understand that they tend to run either ARM or another um, hardware type of, uh, of, of processor, which has some, you know, typically the consumer ones have vulnerabilities because of that design. Um, but that's why you see routers being sold. I believe that most of them use less electricity, even the fancy ones that are $300, um, use less electricity than running a, a computer 24 seven. That's, uh, that's, that's my issue now. I, I pulled an old Dell Optiplex out of surplus to put PFSense on. Uh, years ago and it's been solid but it's you know it, even with everything turned off in the bios it pulls 30 watts sitting there um so i'm actually looking at replacing it that i remember last year i bought that little n100 mini pc um and that's been working great and they make versions of that now with two or three nicks in them um and i'm looking at that that thing sits at sub 10 watts I mean, it can run off of a phone charger, and it's a regular Intel chip, so any x86-64 router distribution will work on it. I really, my only problem with Brent's approach is Linksys and Netgear and Ubiquity and whoever else is out there tends to drop support for their older hardware, yeah. and if I sink a couple hundred bucks into a router and then in two years they're like, we don't support that model anymore, it kind of ticks me off a little bit. Um, and... <laughs> Is that really a concern in in the the use you know the the user space though? Like I I don't yeah, think means I you're ever not, means you're not getting means you're probably not getting security patches for it anymore. Yeah, that's that's an issue. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I I understand yeah. the need for for security, but like the attack surface on on my router is essentially non-existent, right? Like. That you it, know of. it doesn't okay it doesn't exist <laughs> the NSA does. like there, are, there are no open there are, i mean i'm just saying assuming that it, i got it and it was secure yeah um there are no open ports other than from the inside and it's just a password protected website for configuration and so forth it, obviously it was... if something is in is coming from my machine to it, then theoretically it could be uh, attacked, but that's, uh, that's yeah. going to require a little bit more coordination than, than most things have. Um, wireless wise, I mean, I'm in on the boonies. So even if it were poorly situated in some way, wireless, um, you know, it's just, you know, I, my deer aren't that smart, you know, they, they don't know how to, to, to do those things, you know? So in, unless you're, 
in, intentionally driving up my driveway to get within range of my wireless signal. Like, and I realize not everyone is in that scenario, but even so, local attacks, not common. Yeah, so that, you, well, you, be, such a tiny attack surface. But if I were running a, a PC as a router, and especially if I was trying to do fancy stuff, allow, do port forwarding with, I, I just suggest don't port forward unless you really, really need to run a cloud server. You know, there's a lot better ways of doing things these days um, than allowing people into your network. Um, just, uh, it just, it, there's not much to hit, the, the, even if you never update the thing, even if you're terribly lax about that sort of thing, you're probably going to be fine. There's but if you run a piece, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, just a few months ago, they, the FBI shut down some botnet that had compromised a number of older Linksys routers. I mean, you never know. I mean, you're right, there's a low attack service, but if somebody's got a bug out there for that specific bottle that specific firmware um and a lot of those also depend on the default configuration you know if you don't change your password or default stuff mm -hmm. too so it's a risk either way i mean i i use the so i use the open sense for a couple of reasons one hardware support uh two um like i do a number of vpn things and brent's right it's probably not a good reason to i don't even like if I stream or do something, I use that through like a mold vet. Or I know somebody who's got it in the thing. I just kind of want to see how it works. But um, yeah, yeah. But that'll be on a completely separate part of my on a separate network and everything. But it's uh, yeah. So you're right about that. But I, it's, it's I guess I just for me, it's kind of the commodity hardware. They tend to move out of support so fast, and it's uh, if you're like me, I mean, I upgrade every other wi-fi generation basically so it's you know i tend to keep them years and years and years and so that makes me a little bit more worried about the uh about the security side of it but but if you're a typical consumer who like throws it out you know every couple of years you know it's probably not a bad path to go it's just it's um yeah they are built steve has got a point they are built to a price they are built to you know they're, they're also usually sized barely bigger than what the connection is they can handle. That was originally what got me building my own routers in the mid nine in the mid thousands was I upgraded my roommate and I upgraded to the 10 megabit charter connection and the little crappy store routers couldn't handle it. Uh, you know, they didn't have enough CPU and RAM. And so we ended up building our own just to handle that connection. Uh, do some fun security things to basically make them just work very, very slowly. Um, Franklin in 2017, I went to Franklin for the uh, total eclipse. And my my notion is there is no, there is no um, uh, substitute for totality. It, it really is like, it's like, it, it's almost there, almost there. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of like all the same thing, but the totality, it's just a completely different experience. Mm. And I'm glad to have experienced that once in my life. That being said, I'm not spending money or fighting traffic this year to, to do it again. Um, but my, my daughter who was not able to see it in 2017 yeah. is going to <laughs> Santa Claus, Indiana to, uh, to experience it. So. You're right about that. 2017 was a pretty good experience. We had like 98%, I think it was here. And yeah, I mean, I didn't have to go far for, for yeah. totality. Um, but that being said, I did have to fight a lot of traffic on, on the way back. Uh, Cause you know, it's one thing getting there super early. We spent the day there, but we were pretty much done when it was done, but so was everyone else. So yeah. Uh, what I liked about the 2017 when here where I live is not only did the, but the, the routers are at, if, if we're talking about a, a Wi-Fi access point and router, then uh, the antenna technology, MIMO antennas, they get broader coverage in your, in your house. And they are also advertising now Wi-Fi 6, which is an updated uh, uh, Wi-Fi protocol. And... The main issue I have, I, I buy routers like once a year, and I, I bought a fairly inexpensive Netgear router, and and um, I applied the firmware update from Netgear, and it 
disabled remote administration, which really ticked me off because I like to be able to uh, uh, remotely do port forwarding and it no longer uh, allows that. So you got to physically be at the router to, uh, to add uh, port forwards and other administrative tasks. Anyway, that's my comment. Steve? Briefly, that in fact, the limited, Alan, that is supposed to be a safety feature, the elimination. But of course, every safety thing may have a pain in the ass element to it. Yeah. Well, there is a way around it. I mean, I could flash the router with WRT, uh, DDWRT, and, which I use on a bike, but uh, it upsets me that they, in the goal of security, they've really uh, eliminated a, a very useful function, which is remote administration. Yep, <clears throat> true. All right. Uh, any last words from anyone before we just, go? Just this. I understood that while 6 is the latest, 6E and 7 are coming soon. And some people have said, really, if you're going to buy a router because it's a 6, wait a little bit to get either the 6E or the 7. So I don't know if this is the continual improvement problem where you end up never buying something. Save a lot of money that way. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, Steve, on your question, I don't. I think the difference in the store router and the router OS on a computer is just like a lot of Linksys and stuff. They use BSD or Linux. They aren't reinventing the wheel. They're just using that and slapping a GUI on it usually. Well, I was thinking that the advantage of a router designed uh, OS would be that you minimize a lot of attack surface. That yeah, I mean, don't they've need made on a computer uh, that they're not going to use. They've they made some really hard on BusyBox. Yeah, they've they've made some good. Um, they uh, hopefully have made some good configuration choices. Um, but yeah, that's that's mainly the difference is is just configuration and um, presentation, really. So yeah, um, that's yeah. Hopefully, initial comp now. Like I said, some of the uh, some of the store bought routers, especially way back when, they've made some pretty poor security choices and. Um, yeah, right. so, um, but that, I, that's certainly changing a lot now, though, so. Yep. And Microtech, Microtech is one of those ones where it's a router OS, but it they, they you can hang yourself with it. You can, there was, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you can definitely, like, they come pretty unconfigured out of the box, and unless you know what you're doing with networking, you can really expose everything, so. All right. Anything else? Uh, any ideas for next month? Requests? Uh, I haven't thought of anything. All right. Well, let's discuss yeah. it on in the normal channels. Yeah. All right. See you guys right. later. See you all next time. Good all right. Yeah. Take later. care. Bye. Bye. -bye.